thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I would also like to express my gratitude to the organizers for inviting me to this very nice conference location and also for the uh, up to now uh, really spotless organization. So very nice. Um, today, I want to introduce a way of decomposing entropy production. And uh, this relies on uh, a little bit of a geometric uh, intuition about uh, flows in a system. And so this is joint work uh, with uh, Shinichi Sasa at Kyoto University and uh, Sosuke Ito at uh, Tokyo University. So first of all, let me mo motivate a little bit. Why do we want to um, decompose entropy production? Well, our motivation for studying entropy production is we want to understand and characterize out of equilibrium systems because in many applications, in particular for biologic, biological systems, we know that systems are generally out of equilibrium. And um, so we want to characterize how these systems are driven out of equilibrium, what's the difference between them and what are the general properties of out of equilibrium systems. However, one problem with this is that um, out of equilibrium systems are actually very diverse much more so than equilibrium systems, because in order to reach equilibrium, a system has to satisfy very strict constraints, whereas every system that doesn't satisfy these constraints is going to be out of equilibrium. Or in, another, in other words, for any given equilibrium system, you can actually find many ways to drive it out of equilibrium. Um, however, they do have a common characteristic, um, and that is from the point of view of, uh, from th of thermodynamics, out of equilibrium system have a positive entropy production. So no matter how you drive your system out of equilibrium, once you're out of equilibrium, you're going to produce entropy. Um, however, this also introduces another problem because I said we want to characterize and understand the difference between out of equilibrium systems. However, entropy production itself is a very coarse measure. Any out of equilibrium system is going to have entropy production. So just by looking at entropy production, it's very difficult to say how exactly our system is driven out of equilibrium. And the hope is that we can sort of introduce different kinds of entropy production, which tell us in which way our system is driven out of equilibrium. And um, on a, more concretely, we want to decompose entropy production into physically relevant contributions, so which correspond to different, different ways of driving a system out of equilibrium. Um, so let me be a little bit more concrete. Um, in this talk, I'm going to study um, overdamped uh, Lajewa dynamics, so essentially diffusion processes. And in the simplest case, where you have a Brownian particle in one dimension, um, this looks like this. So you have um, the velocity of the particle is given um, by some external force, which may depend on the position, and uh, thermal noise. And in the special case where this external force is, can be written as the gradient, or in one dimension as the, just the derivative of a potential, um, this system is going to reach an equilibrium state at long times. So the system is going to equilibrate and its state is just going to be given by the Boltzmann-Gibbs equilibrium distribution. Now already for this simple system, there are two ways of driving it out of equilibrium. One way is to make the potential time dependent. So to introduce some control parameter, which we vary in time. And as a consequence of this, so for any given control parameter, the system will eventually relax back to an equilibrium state. But because we are changing the control parameters at a finite rate, the system will remain out of equilibrium. Another way um, is to introduce a non-conservative force in the system. And for the one-dimensional case, this actually can only be done for periodic boundary conditions. So you can imagine a particle in a periodic um, potential, and this no, um, non-conservative force then corresponds to a tilting of the potential. So essentially, the particle just rolls down this potential forever. And in this case, the system actually doesn't relax to an equilibrium state, no matter how long we wait, but it will relax to a steady state, and the steady state is out, driven out of equilibrium by flows. So in the flow in this case, or the simple example, is just the drift velocity of this particle in the potential. Now, for a completely general system, we have both effects. So we have time-dependent and non-conservative driving, or the non-conservative force may also be time-dependent. And the question is, can we separate these two effects? Um, so a slightly more general um, version of the system is when we go to D dimensions, which also allows us to consider interacting particles or particles in higher dimensional um, force fields. And in this case, we can actually describe the probability density of finding the system in some state X at time T in terms of this um, Fokker-Planck equation, which here I've written as a continuity equation with this local mean velocity mu. And so physically, this local mean velocity essentially measures 
um, the average speed at which um, the system evolves at a given um, location in space and a given time. And in general, so if you just write down this equation with some general force F, the system is going to be out of equilibrium. And um, in this case, we can uh, we have a very nice characterization of the entropy production rate, so at um, the rate at which the entropy, the total entropy increases. And this is just the square of this local mean velocity averaged. And in particular, if the system is in equilibrium, then there are no flows. So we have detailed balance and this local mean velocity is exactly zero. And of course, this is also the only way in which this entropy production can vanish. So it's always positive and zero only in equilibrium. And um, in what I'm going to do now, I'm going to need a sort of very simple construction, which is an inner product um, with respect to this um, state, uh, with, respect, uh, with, with, with respect to the time dependent state of the system. And this inner product is just the usual scalar product between two vector fields, and I'm averaging over the probability density. And for convenience, I'm going also going to introduce this factor one over mu t here in front, so one over the temperature essentially. And um, with this definition, comparing this to the um, expression for the entropy production rate, you see that the entropy production is just the inner product of the local mean velocity with itself. Now, there are two ways um, which, in which we can decompose um, the entropy production. Um, one is due to Hatano and Sasa. And so here the general idea is um, that we fix the force at some given time. And so imagine we control the force by um, changing some control parameter and we just stop changing the parameter and let the system relax. And it's going to relax to some steady state, um, which I denote by this PT um, superscript ST. So this is the steady state corresponding to the force at some given time. And this is just, mathematically, this is just determined by the steady state Fokker-Planck equation here with this steady state local mean velocity. And it's relatively easy, so this is just three lines of calculation to show that this local, the steady state local mean velocity actually satisfies an orthogonality relation with respect, um, together with its complement with respect to the local mean velocity. So nu st and nu minus nu st are always orthogonal with respect to this inner product. And using this, it's very easy to write down the decomposition because now we've decomposed our vector field into two orthogonal components. So the overlap between these, the cross term vanishes and we just have these two positive contributions. So we can write the entropy production as a sum of two positive terms. And one of them, this essentially measures the magnitude of the flows in the instantaneous steady state. Um, this is called housekeeping entropy. And the other one, that's the difference between the current flows and the flows in the steady state, that's the excess entropy. And these have very nice properties because the housekeeping entropy, you can see this is only non-zero, so it's positive, and it's non-zero whenever the instantaneous steady state is out of equilibrium. So whenever for our given instantaneous force, the system does not relax to an equilibrium state, but to a non-equilibrium steady state. Uh, similarly, the excess entropy um, is positive and zero and non-zero whenever the system is not in the steady state. So whenever we have some time evolution in the state of our system, this excess entropy is going to be positive. And so the physical interpretation of this is that essentially we consider an instantaneous steady state, so which is sort of co-evolving with our driving force, and then we have some deviations from this instantaneous steady state um, which are captured by the excess entropy. And so if now we have this sort of geometric picture in terms of orthogonal components. You can easily draw it like this. So the red line is sort of the local mean velocity. The blue line is the steady state local mean velocity. And then we have this um, difference of them. And these two are always orthogonal with respect to this inner product. <clears throat> now this result, so the decomposition by Hatan and Sasa is actually fairly well known. Um, but surprisingly, there exists a second, um, maybe less well known decomposition. Um, which is due to mass and entogeny. And here the general idea is a little bit different. Instead of considering the steady state at some given force, we first consider the actual time-dependent state of the system. So the time-dependent probability density. And then we ask the question, what is the minimum entropy production for observing the time evolution of this probability density? 
So the state of the system evolves and we ask how much entropy do we actually need to evolve the state of the system? And the answer is two parts. Um, the first part of the answer is that you can show there exists a unique conservative force field that gives the same time evolution. So for any time evolution of the probability density, you can always write down a conservative force field which gives the same time evolution. And the second part of this answer is that um, this conservative force field is actually the one that minimizes the entropy production rate. So in a sense, if we have a given time evolution of the state and we want to know what is the force that minimizes the entropy production given this time evolution, this is just given by this conservative force. And so here I'm denoting this optimal local mean velocity by nu star. And again, we can show that this has some very nice geometric properties in the sense that this difference of nu minus nu star, so in a sense the excess of, uh, so the additional flows in the system um, relative to this optimal local mean velocity are actually orthogonal to any gradient field in the system. And um, in particular, since, the local, since this optimal local mean velocity, which is given by a gradient field, so gradient force, can also be written as a gradient field, this immediately implies that we have the same type of orthogonality relation as for the hatano sasa decomposition. So again, nu star and its uh, complement are orthogonal. And as a consequence of this, we can write the entropy production again as a sum of two positive terms, um, which are housekeeping and excess entropy. And interestingly, these have exactly the same properties as the hatano sasa decomposition. So the housekeeping entropy is positive and it vanishes only when the, when the steady state of the system is in equilibrium state. So whenever the instantaneous steady state is out of equilibrium, or in other words, if there are any non-conservative forces in our system, this is going to be positive. On the other hand, the excess entropy production is positive whenever the system uh, evolves in a time-dependent manner. So whenever the state of the system depends on time. And here the physical interpret interpretation is a little bit different. So where for the hatano sasa decomposition, the baseline is sort of the steady state. In this case, the baseline is the time-dependent state of the system. So we have the time-dependent state plus some non-conservative flows which actually don't contribute to the time evolution. So these are, in a sense, just flowing around in the system and they're not contrib uh, contributing at all to the change in the state. And so for this, we can also have this, um, in this case, a little more useful geometrical picture is that, um, so again, we have this red arrow, which is the local mean velocity. And in this case, this new star, so this optimal local mean velocity with the same time evolution is actually the orthogonal projection of this new into the space of gradient fields. So in a sense, in general, this local mean velocity is not a gradient field. So it has some non-conservative components, which cannot be written as a gradient. But we can always find this new star, which is a gradient field and has the same time evolution. And again, the difference between the two is orthogonal um, to this new star. So now we have two decompositions and both of them have these nice properties that we have two positive terms which vanish only in the steady state or for conservative forces. But in general, they are not equivalent. And so you can easily check some examples and you can show they're not the same. So we have two decompositions which both have nice properties, but they're different. So the question is, what is the relation between them? And then there's a more general issue with these uh, decompositions is that conceptually they're very useful. So it's a very nice conceptual point of view that we can split this entropy production. And also this excess term can be used to restore the equality um, in the Clausius uh, theorem in the quasi-static limit if you have non-conservative forces. Um, but the problem is that in principle, we have to have the full solution of our problem. So we have to know the time dependent probability density of the Fokker-Planck equation, which is typically something you don't know. And the question is, can we actually measure them? So is there any way that if you give me some trajectory data and without computing the probability density that I can tell you what the excess and the housekeeping entropy contained in this trajectory data are? And um, for this, it's very useful to first discuss some general properties of orthogonal projections. So let's say we have some vector space V and in this vector space V, so the vector space V is here is our three dimensional space. And we have some um, vector small V, which lives in this three dimensional space. And then we introduce a subspace, which in this case is this two dimensional gray plane here. And we consider the orthogonal projection of this vector into the subspace. So this is something we all learn in, in basic geometry. <coughs> 
And now it turns out you can write the length of this orthogonal projection in two ways. So the first one is we are looking for the vector inside the subspace V1 that has the maximal overlap with the original vector. So in a sense, and this is actually how you calculate the orthogonal projection. So you project in a sense on the unit vector which has the maximum overlap with your original vector but is, lives in the subspace. So we maximize the overlap between the vector v and some vector u in the subspace. However, an exactly equivalent formulation can be obtained by considering um, vectors that are orthogonal to our subspace. So in this case, this vector u is orthogonal to this plane. And then we can consider the vector v minus u. And in this case, you can, so in this case, so the, the v minus u is now pointing slightly down. And if you vary this vector u, so if you vary the length of this vector u, in this case, the minimal, so the orthogonal, orthogonal projection is actually obtained when the length of this difference is minimal. So this means we can either maximize the overlap in the space or we can minimize the out, the out of plane component in this case. And now since we know that this uh, excess entropy production in the mass entropy decomposition is given as the projection into the space of gradient fields, we can immediately apply these formulas. So that's the first one. So we can just say, okay, so we project the local mean velocity in the space of, into the space of gradient fields, which means we are looking for the gradient field that has the maximum overlap with our local mean velocity. And in this case, the numerator in this expression turns out to be nothing but the time derivative of the average of this um, field phi. So we choose some function phi, we compute its average and the average of the square of the gradient, which for a known function we can do. And if we take the maximum of this expression with respect to phi, this gives us the entropy product, the excess entropy production. Right? On the other hand, the housekeeping entropy production can be obtained by considering the gradient field that is sort of closest to our non-conservative force in the original system. So that's minimizing the out-of-plane component. And from these expressions, you can actually, in principle, calculate the excess and housekeeping entropy from trajectory data. Because for this one, what we have to do is we have to evaluate averages. And so if you give me trajectory data of x of t, I can, in principle, evaluate, tell you what the average of some quantity is, if you give me enough data. And for the second one, this we can also evaluate supposing that we know the non-conservative force. But in many physical settings, we actually do because the non-conservative force is typically something we externally apply to the system. So this is the driving that we apply to the system. Whereas, for example, the interactions between the particles which are contained in the potential part of the force, this we typically don't know exactly. So this is also something that's uh, realistic in many situations. And just to note here, so here we actually only have to optimize over scalar functions, so the, the space over the functions over which we have to optimize is not so large. So for example, we can choose a good basis of uh, scalar functions and then just numerically optimize with respect to the coefficients. And it turns out that at least for not too complicated cases, you can actually do this uh, quite efficiently. Um, the second thing is, um, I said there, is, there are these two decompositions and what is the relation between them. Um, for this, it's very useful to see that the hatano sasa excess entropy can actually also be written as the inner product of a gradient field with itself. And this gradient field is just defined as the log ratio of the time dependent and the instantaneous steady state probability density. So this expression has also been known for some time. Um, but due to this orthogonality relation, we can also write it like this. And now if you compare this expression here with the one that I had on the previous slide for the mass Newtonian decomposition, you can see that the hatano sasa decomposition is just one particular choice of this gradient field whereas the mass Newtonian decomposition is the maximum over all of them. So this immediately implies that the mass Newtonian excess entropy is actually always larger than the hatano sasa one. And so this gives a general relation between the hatano sasa and mass Newtonian. So they are not independent, um, but uh, one, is always, uh, one always has the larger excess component, no matter uh, which system you choose. And so maybe one remark here is that since we said the ma uh, this, this mass Newtonian excess entropy is the minimal entropy production that is required for the time evolution. This also means that 
even though the Satanosasa access entropy gives you, in a sense, some kind of entropic, entropic contribution associated with the time evolution, it's not actually enough to sustain the time evolution. So you need to pay more than the Hatanosasa excess entropy if you actually want to get back the time evolution of your probability density. And then um, the final topic is that um, using this geometric picture, you can actually go beyond these two decompositions. And um, you can show that generically, you can deco always decompose the local mean velocity into three orthogonal components. So two of them we are already know. So this is the new minus new star from the mass and touch decomposition, the new minus new t from the Hatanosasa. But there's a, there's a third one which actually quantifies the difference between the steady sta the local mean velocity and the sum of sort of the minimum um, local, the optimal local mean velocity and the steady state one. And you can show that all these three components are actually always orthogonal. And now we have three orthogonal components. This also means we get three positive contributions to entropy production. And the first ones um, are the same as before. So the excess entropy is positive whenever the system is not in the steady state. The housekeeping entropy is positive whenever there are non-conservative forces. So we can identify time-dependent effects and we can identify non-conservative effects. But there's also this third term and actually, if you write down this third term, you can show that it can be written like this. So in a sense, the new star is, are the flows that contribute to the time evolution. Whereas the new ST are the steady state flows. So if there's a non-trivial overlap between the time evolution and the steady state of the system, then um, this coupling entropy is going to be positive. And for this reason, that's also the reason why we call it coupling entropy because it quantifies how much the time-dependent driving and the non-conservative driving talk to each other. So how much they interact. And as a simple demonstration, um, let me give you a solvable example. Um, this is the so-called Brownian gyrator. So you just consider a moving um, parabolic potential. So just a parabolic potential whose position is moved in a time-dependent way. So you can think of as a trapped particle. And um, in addition to this uh, trapping potential, we also consider a non-conservative force. Um, but in this case, it's quite simple. So it's just essentially always push, pulling the particle around the origin. So this is um, indicated by these uh, circles here in the picture. So essentially, the particle is pulled around the origin, both by this trapping potential and also by the non-conservative force. And so for simplicity, here I'm going to focus on a time periodic state, so where this driving is just a circle around the origin. And um, I'm going to uh, talk about the long time limit, so what happens in the long time limit if you keep driving the particle around the origin. And the advantage of this system is that since all the forces are linear, we can actually compute all quantities analytically in principle. And in particular, for this time periodic state, you can also write down the uh, explicit expressions and they're not so difficult. But it's more interesting to look at what actually happens. So this is now the entropy production rate as a function of the magnitude of this non-conservative force. And so what you can see is that, um, so here this driving frequency, so fa how fast I'm moving to potential is four. You can see there's actually a clear maximum in the entropy production when this uh, non-conservative driving, so in a sense the how fast the non-conservative driving moves the particle around and how fast you're moving it around using the potential when those precisely coincide. And the reason is simply that if in a sense the non-conservative driving and the time-dependent driving sort of precisely uh, are precisely synchronized, then the particle moves the fastest. And since the dissipation is proportional to the velocity of the particle, since we're dragging the particle through a fluid, this is also when the dissipation is the highest. Now let's look at this decomposition. Um, so here in blue is the excess entropy, green is the housekeeping entropy, and red is the coupling entropy. And you can see, so first of all, the housekeeping entropy, it's not so interesting. Um, it's essentially what you expect. So it's zero if you don't have any non-conservative force and then it just increases. So you're just driving more and more. So in a sense, your steady state gets more and more out of equilibrium. Um, for the excess entropy, you can see that you do have a small peak at the position where these uh, drivings are exactly in sync. So in a sense, the, the state is a little bit more time dependent in this case. But actually the predominant contribution comes from the coupling entropy in this case where the external driving and the non-conservative force precisely add up. 
And this is even more um, clear if you um, write it in terms of the relative. So this are just the individual components divided by the total entropy production. So here the um, blue, green, and red line always sum up to one. And you see that, so if there's no um, non-conservative driving at all, then all entropy production is excess entropy production because we are just driving, dragging the particle around the origin in this time-dependent potential, and there are no conservative forces. Whereas for large non-conservative forces, most of the entropy production is due to the housekeeping part. But in between, you have this uh, very clear maximum um, of the coupling part. So where you really, in a sense, it's the interaction between the non-conservative and the time-dependent driving that gives you the main contribution to entropy production. Um, so let me briefly summarize. Um, I showed you this um, geometric interpretation of both the Hatano Sasa and Meslin Tocchi decomposition. And uh, one result of this is that we get some variational expressions that actually can be used to compute the excess entropy from trajectory data without knowing the probability density of the system. And the second result is that we find this new decomposition into three positive terms, where this new coupling term quantifies the interaction between time-dependent and uh, non-conservative driving. And with this, maybe um, let me give you the, the references. So this is the, the first paper is essentially about the application of this variation, the derivation and application of this variational formula. The second one is more focused on this uh, coupling entropy. And more recently, we also put a, a preprint out where um, this has been characterized also to jump processes and chemical reaction networks. So this is not limited to the Lajima case but many of these concepts also survive in, in more general systems. And uh, finally, let me make a brief um, advertisement. Um, so there is a poster by uh, Takuya Kanijima, and he is actually talking about thermodynamic uncertainty relations for excess and housekeeping entropy. So it turns out these excess and housekeeping entropy also um, satisfy some of these uh, recently very popular thermodynamic uncertainty relations, and he's going to present uh, how these actually also can be used to infer, for example, excess entropy uh, production from measurements. And so with that, um, let me finish, and thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Okay, we have a few minutes, we can, okay. Okay, so thank you for your nice talk. So is your um, formulation is applicable to under damp dynamics? Um, I did think about this for quite some time. Um, I mean, you can do something formally for under damp dynamics, uh, but working anything out in practice is quite hard. So the problem is that for under damp dynamics, you don't have this one-to-one -one correspondence between the state and conservative force anymore. So this relation doesn't hold. And you can still formalize, formally you can derive a decomposition even into four terms for the under damp case. Um, but the physical interpretation is not so clear at the moment. Can I ask a second question? So, I mean, you suggest how to um, measure the mild synoptonic yep. decomposition and yep. reproduction. So, is there any way to measure the Hatano Sasa decomposition? Um, as far as I know, no. The problem is for the Hatano Sasa decomposition, you need to know the instantaneous steady state. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is uh, the problem is a little easier because generally um, it's e much easier to solve the steady state Fokker Planck equation compared to the time dependent one. So if you can solve the steady state Fokker Planck equation for your time dependent force, then in principle you can calculate the Hatano Sasa decomposition. So it's a little easier compared to uh, directly calculating the Meslin Tocchini, but I don't think there is a similar way of just looking at the trajectories uh, getting this. It's uh, probably quite hard. Though, as I said, there are some ways at least to get uh, quantit quantitatively good estimates using these uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relations. Okay. Hello. So what do you mean by actually instantaneous steady state? 
because usually like when system is under uh, time independent forces after long time limit they reach a unique steady state or yes. it might be multiple sta yes. uh, uh, steady state but uh, in a long time limit yes. so uh, uh, i don't uh, 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 know the under like uh, understand the notion of instantaneous steady state ah, can okay. you elaborate so that that's really um so the the concept is a little uh, take some getting used to i i know okay. so the picture is really um you imagine that your force is de it depends on some external control parameter. So okay. for example, you tune the strength of your trapping field or whatever. Okay. And you imagine just stopping. So you just stop whatever you're doing to the system and let it relax. Let it relax, okay. And in that limit, it will go to some steady state. Okay. But this steady state depends on where you actually stopped changing the force. Okay. So it does depend on the time dependence of the force in a sense. Okay. So in that sense, the steady sta this instantaneous steady state depends on time. Okay. But as I said, it's, it's a kind of a virtual construct. So whether you can really get this in experiment is not always the case. So okay. you have it, to be able, in a sense, to stop your manipulation and just let the system relax. Okay, it looks more like, like multiple steady state because it depends upon some initial state where you are stopping your, uh, like... Essentially, uh, yes. So it depends on the, not on the initial state, but on the state of the force. So on the value okay. of the force where you're stopping. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on. If there's no further questions, then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.